Um, what I'm going to do is go fairly quickly through that, and then we're going we're gonna to open up a text um, that I have used and I think that can be helpful in helping someone who struggles with depression. And I'm going to let you help me to know how you would apply that text in helping someone with depression. So now we're, we're talking about how do we speak and do ministry with somebody. Um, so just some thoughts on depression. The experience of depression, and this is things that are generally understood in, in the world of diagnosis of depression. Depression is a, a spectrum. We talked about a spectrum of things along. So uh, depression is not something that you have or don't have. Depression is an issue of severity of how you are functioning um, in relationship to the world around you. So even in diagnosis, there are severe depression diagnosis. There are relatively mild depression diagnosis. They have to do with your ability to function in a normal way. If someone is, is uh, struggling to... Uh, to exist in life because they're living with a sense of oppression. Um, they may not withdraw. They may be able to go, to go to work. They may be able to do things, but then they retreat from people and they live with a constant sense of, um, of, of living in a hole. Some, they describe, sometimes people in depression describe it as, I, I feel like I've gone down a hole and I can't get out. Some people can be very functional in that hole. Other people can't. They can't function at all. So it's not a you have it or don't have it. In fact, we all, frankly, um, deal with it in some way. For some people, it's seasonal. There are certain times of year that they're affected, some situ situations. If you aren't, at some sense, at times low or down, you probably you probably may not be dealing with life the way you should. Life should affect us in ways that, um, because life is hard. Um, and so, so the fact that you are feeling depressive feelings is not a bad thing. Some people tend to be more that way. Some people tend to be what we call introspective. They, they tend to think about things deeply internally. They can be much more susceptible to, to depression than others. Um, but so it's a it's not a have it or don't have it it's a how is a particular mood struggle affecting your life it's a whole person experience it's not just your emotions and your thinking sometimes people who want to help people with depression talk about how you need to you know you need to you need to stop feeling the way you're feeling or you need to think differently but the reality is um, you know it it affects people's sleep it affects their eating habits, their overall ability to function and focus in life. And typically what happens in depression is when somebody is falling into it, everything starts to unravel. They don't sleep as well, so they're much more... They may, they may be sleeping at the wrong times. They may be sleeping too much. They, they may not eat well. They may um, they, they withdraw from relationships. So a lot of things happen. It's a whole person experience. The causes of depression are complicated and are highly debated. If you look at the research on depression, um, it really isn't anything clear about why people struggle with it. Uh, um, they, they talk about some people are more genetically predisposed. There's some evidence of that, nothing conclusive. Um, they talk about brain chemistry. In fact, if you're, ta if you're talking to a, somebody who's in psychology, they're going to talk a lot about brain chemistry, um, that you lack serotonin or there's things going on in your brain. There's truth to that, but there's no, there's no evidence that a lack of serotonin causes depression. Or, or does depression call a lack of, cause a lack of serotonin, which is just a, it's a chemical in the brain. So when someone says depression is a chemical imbalance, they're not basing that on hard science. It's very debatable about that. Um, there's evidence, but not hard science. Environment, where somebody's living affects. Um, you'll often see, for example, people who are displaced from, from a place of, of, of familiarity to a place of, dis, 
of, of not familiarity, struggling with depression um, because the environment affects them. Um, relational deficiency, somebody has either doesn't have good relationships or has relational breakdown can, can, can lead to depression. Uh, stress, someone lives and doesn't respond well to the stress in life. Uh, depression, um, crisis, a crisis event can, can, can create a depressive experience. Um, there are physical conditions that people have where, where, um, where it affects them in a certain way that chronic pain Somebody had, lives with chronic pain. I have a friend of mine. The friend we prayed for um, yesterday who's got, who's got stage 4 cancer, he's had a headache from an un... They don't know why, but he's had a headache for the last 30 years all the time. He never not has a, doesn't have a headache. He's, he's at times... He, he, he's not a man who struggles with depression, but every day he has to face this, and sometimes he just says, my... My soul just gets weary from dealing with constant pain all the time. Um, there's a lot of things that come into it. Um, to, depression is unpredictable. Uh, most people who struggle with depression, not everybody, but they describe as falling into it. And then when it ends, they describe as it lifting so they can, through no cause, they can find themselves spiraling or falling into depression. There's no, no, no sense of cause. And, um, and they can come out of it. They can be, you can have somebody, you'll have this, and if you're dealing with people who struggle with depression in your church, you will find that they will fall into depression. They'll maybe disappear. They'll maybe just be hard to reach. And they won't be responsive to anything. And then one Sunday, they'll just show up at church. And they'll start functioning. Somehow it lifted. So it's, it's, it's difficult to know how to help somebody because of that. Um, because the causes are unpredictable or unclear, the, the treatment approaches are unclear. We talked yesterday about how medication is proven to be helpful sometimes, but not always helpful. And medication for depression includes a lot of side effects that can be a problem. In fact, one of the biggest... Uh, side effects of depression is increasing suicidal tendencies, suicidal thoughts. So you're dealing with, one of the things that's happening with depression medication, that's why people have to be very careful. You may not have a lot of medication for, for depression here, but it, certainly there's money to be made in it, and if there's money to be made, it's going to make it. <laughs> it's going to come because there's a place to make money. There's a market for it. Um, but, but the hard part is that people take medication for depression like they take it for a headache. If I, have a, if I have a headache, I take an aspirin or I take a Tylenol or something to fix a headache. Depression medication doesn't work like that. You, you have to get on it very carefully and you can't just stop taking it. A lot of times where suicides happen is people who just either get tired of the medication or they just forget to take it or they just stop taking, and that, and that sends them into suicidal tendencies. So medication is, can be helpful, but it's also problematic. Um, uh, so, uh, and for the Christian, battling depression brings with it an additional burden, the sense of shame and rejection by God. And if you're dealing with a believer who struggles with depression, they're almost always going to also be dealing with shame and a sense of abandonment. And it's actually often not a abandonment by God. It goes something like this. I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to have faith. Anybody who's a Christian, their life should be transformed. My life is not transformed. I know God is perfect. Therefore, the problem can't be with God. Therefore, it must be with me. It's not God's fault. It's my fault. If God can't help me, then I must be beyond saving. I am unsavable. And that has to make God angry. Why would he even keep trying? I've failed God, and now he's fed up with me. 
That's the typical thought pattern for a believer who's struggling with depression. So offering the hope of God is often, at least initially, seen as you don't understand. God has already rejected me because he, he should. If God is really God, He should reject somebody like me because I am beyond saving. That's a typical depression experience. Um, depression distorts reality. What depression does is it has a tendency to magnify, make more important what I don't have. And then it clouds over, makes it difficult to see what I do have. So somebody who is struggling with depression cannot see any good in their life. All they see is bad. So when you, when you try to point out what's good, they don't get it. No, there's nothing good. And if you start pointing things out, they will tell you why that isn't good. They already have reasoned themselves away from that anything in life being good. But, but you have friends. Well, yeah, but you know, my friends, they aren't really faithful. They, don't really, they aren't reaching out to me. Um, well, you know, read your Bible. Well, I've tried that. It doesn't work. Well, you know, just think you have your health. Well, you know, now I do, but I, you know, if you ask me, I don't know if I'll have my health. I don't think I can count on that. They always come up with a negative reason. Um, the struggle with depression is at root a struggle with sin. Depression is a intense worship of self. We, we, even though we don't relate to somebody who's in depression and go to them and say, you're sinning, stop sinning, that's not going to help them, we do have to recognize that the, the problem is that someone has, is so worships himself that they will not tolerate any other authority in their lives but themselves. One way you'll know that is if you... Uh, um, If you challenge their self-assessment, you will find somebody who feels like they have no emotion whatsoever. I have no emotion. I can't feel anything. Well, challenge them on their self-assessment about whether they, God has abandoned them or not. They will stop having no emotions and they'll get angry with you. Emotion is there, but it's only directed at you attacking their worship of self. We have to be careful with that because we can drive them away. With depression, you're trying to continue conversation. You're trying to walk with somebody, not confront them, and then say, well, they didn't receive my counsel, so I can't help them. But there is a, in the people I've dealt with with depression, there is a strong commitment. I know myself better than anyone, even God. And what I think about myself is all that matters. That's what depression does. Yeah, counsel, uh, depression counseling is one of the most difficult kinds of counseling. You talk to any counselor, they'll say depression is one of the most difficult because everything you try doesn't work. And then the, the person will tell you that. Thank you for trying, but you're not, you're not able to help me. And so we have to not play that game. So, for example, with your brother, I'm not going to say what you should do because I don't want to speak into the situation as if I really understand. But the fact that he has opened to you to at least contact him is an expression from him of trust. And what you're trying to do is keep that bridge open. That's your goal. Because at some point, if he starts to wonder whether I want to live in life, he may reach out to you. If you have the bridge, if you don't have the bridge, you, you won't reach out. So imagine yourself, one of the things with depression, and I, I, I try to imagine, in, if we have a good relationship, imagine yourself, you, imagine a, a, a river, and uh, maybe I can draw it. Well, I'll just do it. Imagine a river and imagine two sides of the river and there needs to be a bridge across the river, right? If you're going to build a bridge across a river, it should be built from both sides at the same time. If you're going to have a good relationship, it should be built from both sides at the same time. And, and you meet in the middle. That's a good relationship. 
With depression, the other person doesn't want to build on their side. We don't stop building. We keep building. We keep finding ways to build the bridge, hoping that at some point they'll build enough to where we can connect. So for you, that might mean, okay, I'm going to text them and just occasionally just say, hey, just thinking about you, you know, praying for you. Um, had this Bible verse, just wanted to send you. No expectation he'll get back to you. No, no sense that he has an obligation to respond to you. If you talk to him, don't try to counsel him. Let him draw you into it. That's what I would do. I wouldn't try to... I'd be listening, doing a lot of trying to... And it's hard when you're on the phone because you can't see the person's face and how they're doing, and so you don't always know very much. Um, you know, asking how I can pray, asking... Is he, does he confess to know Christ or no? Okay. Then, yeah. And so you're... Um, so sometimes people will say, yeah, but he... Once that lifts, they'll say, the one thing I appreciate is that they remembered me and they kept trying to find ways to encourage me, but they never expected me to respond. And they felt that was good care. So as long as you don't have expectation that he's got to respond to you or expectation that your counsel is the most important thing, then you say, Lord, what do I need to do? Sometimes with a depressed person, I'll just keep them regularly in my prayers and I'll ask God to give me direction for a next step. And I take my confidence in my step, not because it's going to help them, but because God's told me to do it. I'm being obedient. So in counseling, a lot of times, we want to make sure what we do is based on obedience to Christ, not based on what we think the person needs. Is that helpful? That's a beautiful question because you're recognizing something very important. One of the principles of counseling is we can't counsel somebody who we're not talking to. So one of the things we talk about in counseling is if someone comes in and they talk about another person, I can't, I can't tell you how to deal with them because I'm not in the situation. I can only counsel you in how you're doing with the situation. So for your sister, you might have a tremendously valuable place, and that might be what God is doing, and maybe what you're doing with your sister is saying, is there anything I can do to help? I want to encourage. We're going to talk about encouragement this afternoon. Speaking words of encouragement, reminding, reminding her of of. Of, of the amazing work she's having to do, making sure she feels like she's supported, making sure she feels like you don't have any expectation that she has to do what you want her to do or that she has to respond to you. You're, you're holding her up. A lot of times, same with people who are dealing with addictions. If you have somebody who's, who's got somebody who's addicted or depressed, um, the caregivers have their own trials. And so we, want to, we can help a caregiver, even if we can't help the person they're trying to care for. So that's a great place to put your energy. You know, um, your effort is to making sure she feels, she feels supported. It can be very, very helpful. And that's meaningful gospel care. Um, so just a couple more things. On depression, um, I had an illustration. A friend of mine and his wife, uh, he, was, he battled depression. And he was taking medication. And they asked me to come some, uh, one time to talk with him. And, I, and the issue is they were arguing over medication. And... He was saying, because he was artistic, it, it was affecting his creativity. And he was saying, I don't feel like I am who I'm supposed to be because of the medication. I would like to get off the medication. And his wife was saying, but when you're not on the medication, you're not the person your family needs. Do you see the challenge there? 
both of them have a real important perspective. Should he be on or should he not? She was saying, when you're not on your medication, we don't recognize you. And that hurts us. That affects us. But he was saying, when I'm on medication, I don't know who I am. Because the medication is, is, is affecting how I understand myself. That's what happens with these things. It's a question of who am I? Who are you when you're dealing with something like depression? Are you the depressed person or are you the non-depressed person? And that's a struggle for identity. Um, one place to go uh, if you're trying to help somebody who's, de who's depressed, dealing with depression, um, is, is uh, Psalm 23. You guys are obviously familiar with Psalm 23. Turn there and let's take a few minutes I'm going to, as, you're, as you're turning there, I'm going to draw a little picture here. And I'm sure in various ways this text in your studies or in your personal devotions or your personal study has become, is familiar. One of the reasons I think it's a good text to talk with somebody who's struggling with depression over if they're willing to open up the Bible is people who are struggling with depression have foggy thinking, they can't focus very well, they have a hard time with, with uh, clear thinking. So if they're a believer and they just know Psalm 23, they don't have to do a lot of hard thinking. It may be just something they remember from being a child, maybe they know songs about it. So it's a great psalm because it doesn't it doesn't require much of them to, to talk about. You don't, you're not dropping into, uh, you know, into Paul. You're not dropping into, uh, you know, significant teachings by Jesus. There are other places you can go too, but this one's a wonderful place to go because there's a lot here for someone who struggles with depression. So um, I'm going to read it. And then what I want is just for a few guys just to offer out any... You haven't had a chance to think about it this way, but as you look at the text, just offer out, how would I use something from this text to help somebody who's struggling with depression? What would draw your attention then that might you think might help with somebody who's struggling with depression? So let's read. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So let me, let me give you one thing. You probably know this um, contextually. Um, some connect this psalm to Psalm 22, uh, which is a fascinating way to read it, but let's not go there. But the context most likely of this text, most people read Psalm 23 and they picture David, and you guys probably know this, they picture David in his shepherding days reflecting on, as he's shepherding the sheep, he's reflecting on God's shepherding of him. The reality is this psalm is probably written as he's fleeing uh, enemies. We're not sure who. But he's actually on the run. He's a man who, is, who has been cast out and is all by himself and is all alone and has no hope at that moment in his life and that's why he's writing this 
So that's one reason it can fit is because the person who wrote it was living in that experience of being absolutely abandoned and alone and oppressed from all sides, which is why I think it's appropriate to use. So give me thoughts, just your own thoughts about how you might use it. I'm not going to evaluate the thoughts. I'm just curious if you were opening it up in a counseling situation, how you might use it. Yeah, one of the things you're saying there I think is very good is that, is that we're not talking about sin right now. We're talking about suffering, right? One, one of the great things about this psalm is that you can explore the full depth of the person's experience without ever talking about sin. And why is that necessary? Because if they can't find themselves in the Bible, you talking about sin makes so, no sense to them. You have to help them find them. The Bible does speak to me. You know, if the, if the person is living as if the Bible does, I'm not in the Bible, I'm outside the Bible, then when you start bringing passages about sin in, it's gonna be, it doesn't matter. That doesn't, that doesn't matter to me. But when they understand, oh, right here, this speaks about me. Then you, you can easier go to say, well, the Bible says other things about you as well. And let's look at those at some point. Yeah. Yeah. There is. There's self-worship. That's, that's where somebody has to repent before they can truly find freedom. Now, I say that to say it doesn't mean there aren't physical things that are happening. Um, just like with anxiety, right? If someone, and you guys are familiar with anxiety attack, right? When someone just can't stop thinking, they can't, think, you know, the, the thing you don't do is say repent. Okay, I'm repenting, I'm repenting, repenting you know, and they, 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 they just can't stop. You have to help them settle down. Maybe it's you have to help them breathe, you have to help them in the way they're processing. But eventually, if somebody's going to change, you have to help them see where the false worship is. We always have to end up there in some form to really help somebody. But we talked about yesterday, but if we're not patient, if we go to sin first, we will drive them away. So I think, I think yeah, counseling is always working what is sin and what is suffering. There, everybody is always a saint. As a believer, we're always a saint. We're always a sufferer. We're always a sinner. We're always all those things. Counseling is trying to figure out how I want to relate to this person right now. Do I, do I want to relate to them as a saint? Okay, brother, you, Jesus is for you. Let's, let's go after God. Um, do I want to relate to him as, as a sufferer? You're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't want to break the bruised reed. Or do I relate to them as a sinner? Brother, you're, 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 you know the truth and you're denying it. Well, no, because I think that this is the issue with psychological diagnosis. They've taken the idea of what's medical and they've expanded it. We'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow into whatever's got a physical dimension. They do that because they deny sin. They can't explain the, if you don't have sin involved in your understanding of human life, then everything has to be medical. We're both and. I say. <laughs> we, we, we stand on a biblical anthropology. This is what we'll talk about tomorrow some, how, how, the count, how the psychological world views who we are and therefore how we need to be fixed versus how the Bible says who we are and how we need to be fixed. There are big differences. But we're still people, right? I'm still somebody who's suffering, right? So my friend who has cancer, he might not respond well in his soul. He might get angry or bitter. And I'll need to help him because that's sinful. Or he might respond in a, in a godly way and say, I just need encouragement to keep pressing on, and I want to step in and speak to him encouragingly. Here's how the Bible describes us. This is, I'm, taking a, I'm, I'm using 
in language, I'm, I'm not making the exact quote, but this is Ed Welch, how he describes it. He says, a, a biblical anthropology, a biblical understanding of, of, of who we are as human is that we are, we are, we are physical and we are soul. And, and those are together. They can't be separated in this life. The physical affects the soul, and the soul affects physical. We know that, right? But he says the way the Bible treats it is that when it talks about the flesh um, or the, the, the physical, the physical is talked about in terms of its weaknesses and its limitations in the Bible. The soul is talked about in terms of its propensities, its willfulness. So we can have in ourselves both a weakness, depressive tendency, and a willfulness, unbelief, functioning in the same experience. And that's what we have with depression. You have a weakness that's a physical weakness and that it might be, we don't know fully how it works, but we know God allows for us to have physical weakness. And we can have soul unbelief or sin. So as counselors, biblical counseling has not done well when it's denied the physical and only talked about the spiritual. And other kind of Christian counseling has not done well when it's talked all about the physical but doesn't give attention to the spiritual. The Bible calls us to always think of us as whole people. That's my appeal. We're always whole. We don't need to figure out what's sin and what's physical. We don't, we're, it's, that's only God. What? Go ahead. Yeah, this is good. Well, that's why we have to be discerning and wise in terms of how we speak and when we say what we say. There may be a lot of things we, we understand, but we know they're not ready to hear that yet. So we don't just speak based on what we know. We try to think what's going to be most helpful. So if you have a person who, for example, you feel is very vulnerable to self-condemnation, you don't necessarily go, let's talk about your sin. Yes, yes. We have to treat both. We have to speak to both. Brother, you're suffering. Um, and in case of depression, we have an additional part, which is isolation. Someone doesn't have relationship with people. They feel alone. So let me do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a diagram that may help, right, and how to help somebody with depression. Um, with, uh, with depression, the feeling for most people can be described as I'm here and I'm in a room with walls with no door and no window. I'm completely closed off. I, I'm trapped inside a, an experience. That's the way people describe it. They may describe it as a hole. Sometimes they describe it as a prison. But the bottom line is I'm here and I'm stuck and I can't get out, right? Sometimes the mistake we make is we think, oh, you need medication, or you need prayer, or you need this. Th this came to me um, a number of years back. We used to go to the, to the shore, and we would, we would get this little house at the shore. Just not a very nice house, just a two, one maybe bedroom, two bedrooms old house, but in, in where we lived, it was all closed up for, for half the year because it's cold, right? And so this might not make sense if you haven't been to the beach a lot, but the shore a lot, but, but if you have a, 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 a building at the shore, at, 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 the, at the ocean that's been closed up, when you go to it, you open up the door and the house smells like fish. There be, may be no fish in it, but because the air has fish in it, 
it goes, once you close it up, all that air gets trapped inside, and then the fish smell takes over, the bad smell. So any kind of enclosed space, you know that. There's going to be, that whatever's in there is going to get worse. Um, so that's the experience. Someone's, it's, it's the air in someone's life is bad. So if I'm going to help somebody, if I'm going to go to that house, I'm going to open up the door, hoping that by opening up the door, some good air gets in, right? And some bad air gets out. But if I understand in my room down here, if I open up one of the windows in my room, it doesn't make that much difference. I have to go to another part of the apartment to open up another room. Why? So that there's a breeze, right? So this is kind of like if, if I said to someone, brother, you need to pray. And it'd be like opening up one door. There'd be some benefit to it, but it's not going to let the full life that he needs in. So I might want to say, well, you know what? If I'm in my house, I'm going to say, I'm going to open up another window. Let's open up another window as well. And let's say this is prayer. And let's say this is Bible. Let's read your Bible. Now, you're not trying to help them make sure their Bible. But if someone begins to pray according to God's word, then that prayer starts to help them. Well, brother, you know what? You haven't been coming out to church. Why don't you come out to church, okay? That's another window. Fellowship and worship. You're opening up another window. What are some other windows you might open up for a depressed person? Exercise. What's that? Exercise. Why don't we get outside and exercise? Okay. What else? Friends. friends. Yeah. You have friends. Was that? Fellowship. fellowship. Well, fellowship. Yeah. Well, fellowship. But when I'm thinking, that, let's say, let's say, it, let's say, worship is a, another one. Worship with the saints, and then we'll call that one the Friends Fellowship. The point is, if you're going to help anyone who's depressed, you can't come to them with just one window. Open this window up. It's actually very helpful for them to see something like this. I would like to open up as many windows as you're willing to open up. None of these alone will make a difference. Coming to church next Sunday will not change your life. Opening up your Bible itself will not change your life. But the way God has designed His grace, these are simply means of grace. They are ways God's grace can function in someone's life. When someone is living in depression, they are closing themselves off from all of grace. All we're saying is that God's grace is sufficient. It's all, it's all around Let's find ways for God's grace to start to work. And when people do this, another one might be uh, eating and sleeping or whatever. It could be any number of things. You know what, what, what counselors said? One of the best things to do is help other people. Let's serve. Let's get you involved in serving. Why? Because you're getting your mind off yourself onto other people's needs. The, the mistake that people try to make when they're helping depressed people is they just, they just open up one door and they keep trying to tell them to go through that door. What you want to do is you want to have as many windows open as possible in that person's life because God begins to work and, they begin, and these things connect. So, so what happens is they're, they open up their Bible and you're telling them, listen, you're probably not going to get much of it because you're not, you're not necessarily going to approach it with as if this is... God's speaking to you today, but you're going to read your Bible, and I want you to pray. I want you to take five minutes. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell somebody, here's what I want you to do. It's called my 555 plan. I'd like for you to pray or spend time with the Lord five minutes a day for five days over five weeks. That's what I tell them to do. I've never seen someone who's committed to five minutes of prayer and Bible. Only five minutes, both, prayer and Bible, five minutes. Three minutes in a passage, two minutes to pray. 
five straight days over five weeks who has said it didn't make a difference. Why? Because those five minutes a day applied faithfully, God blesses. God enters in. The grace of God begins to flow in and undo the work of depressing thinking. Then I'll say, you know what, let's do this. Let's, you, you, you're having trouble coming. You don't like being around people right now. Listen, okay, here, come to church. Listen, I'll meet you and we'll sit together. And you don't have to talk to anybody. I'll be right there. Just come. I had a woman who, who, uh, who didn't leave her house for two years. And, um, and I was able to convince her to just come out one day to church. And I said, I'll sit with you. And she was scared. She was fearful because she hadn't been around people. And we just... She had an experience of being in a, an environment that she felt was unsafe, wasn't as unsafe as she thought. Gave her faith to take steps. The point for depression is you'll never answer depression with one answer. You want to help someone begin to take responsibility to open up windows. You can't open up for them. But getting to, to, to your question, th that's, why, that's why we don't have to worry so much about is it physical? Is it spiritual? We can just not worry about all that and say the problem is you're feeling a lack of grace in your life and I want to help you with that. And if, and if I do that, God can do the work. Depression is very difficult. It takes a great deal of patience. And it takes us doing a lot of patient working at a slow pace with somebody, but always saying, let's open up a window. You know, let's open up another window. Let's open up another window. And then I've seen God move in such a way as that, and then the, the depression lifts. And not only has the depression lifted, but the person now has sound biblical habits at work. Now, they are reading their Bible. The problem with Someone who's depressed where it just lift is all their, they've, they've been disconnected with people. Uh, they haven't been serving. You know, they haven't been doing well at their job. And what happens is all that pressure comes on them and it sends them back. But if you're helping them slowly over time begin to reopen their lives, then when it does lift, they actually have some godly practice already in place. They're already attending. They're already serving. They're already... So that's how I say you have to help somebody with depression. You have to help them open up their lives in a variety of ways over time. Any questions before we, before we close? So you're thinking more of a shorter term for three or four weeks. No, no I'm actually trying to, to not do that. I'm trying to recognize that everybody is unique. And so I want to have a general idea of how to help people no matter where they're at based on their experience, not on what I think they should do. That's why I don't ever diagnose people. Yeah, in this case, I'm talking about the worst case. You may have a friend who's got mood swings. They have good moods and they have bad moods. What you're doing more to help them there is when they're not having a bad mood, Maybe you're talking about how can, what are your goals for when you get in that bad mood? When they're in a good mood, say, well, okay, tell me what you do when you're in that bad place. How can I help make sure through accountability, through re outreaching, through prayer, how can I help you in those bad times? Um, and, and, and they actually give you permission. Listen, do this for me in those times. If it's, a, if it's a shorter situation or somebody is kind of goes in and out, I'd like for them to give me permission on how to help them because they're able to think about it in their good times. My issue with depression is a lot of times you don't have somebody who can think over a long period of time, and that's why it's hard. And I'm glad you're mentioning that because what I'm doing is I'm relating to you guys as pastors who are helping other people. 
not if you're dealing with it. I don't want to counsel you from this about how you deal with it. That would be a different conversation because I don't want to presume based on this in interaction that I understand. That's why it's so important when we counsel. We, I'm, I'm in training mode right now. I'm not in counseling mode. And so you're being very gracious to work with me with someone who has the real experience and you're trying to apply it. How does this help me? I think you're going to be able to help others tremendously because you'll have some awareness of what they're dealing with. And you'll be able to know when they're saying certain things what they really mean by that. You're going to be able to ask great questions. You're going to have a great tone. You're not going to come in dropping in and coming heavy. You're probably going to have a great wisdom. Um, we, if we experience things, it can give us a great wisdom. We have to be careful not to presume. We never presume we understand someone else in their life. If I've had a struggle, that I, but I can share, I, people want to know that you can identify with what they're struggling with, and it helps them. And so, I think it's going to be great. Just the very the way you're asking these questions, brother, indicates a thoughtful, pastoral perspective about how to help people who can feel like there's no way to help them. So I want to thank you for that. It's very helpful. I don't struggle with depression, so I have to learn from people who do to be able to know how to help. So thank you.